So now to go step by step, I'll do a walkthrough on how you can do this effect yourself. So start by going to this link and download the cloud asset. Open 3ds Max under the geometry panel, go to Redshift, click the volume tab, and then open the modify panel and click volume. Click on the three dots, go to where you've saved the cloud asset, and then open the WD at the half resolution. On display, change it from the bounding box to points. Check the keep points in memory box. Open the redshift renderer. Change the output size to a 16 by nine ratio and shrink the size to a more manageable number. That way we can just keep like doing test renders and see where everything is at more quickly. Now rotate the cloud on the X axis by 90 degrees and then rotate it on the Z by 180 degrees. Go to the helpers tab, get the tape measure and measure the length of the cloud. Go to the modify tab, check the specify length box to 5,000 centimeters. Now loosely scale up the cloud to measure the tape measure. And then open up the target camera. You can also press control C or command C. Make the camera have a 35 millimeter lens and then save the file. Go to the lights panel, go to redshift, click on the dome, and then put it behind the cloud and the camera. Open the bitmap and put it under CG Skies, a free HDRI map that I included in the drop down below that you can click on. Now open up the renderer panel by pressing F10. So under output unified sampling, change it from 4 to 64, from max samples to 512, adaptive error threshold to 0.1. Go to GI on primary GI engine and secondary GI engine. Select brute force. On the brute force tab, change it to 256. Open the material editor with M. Open the standard box. Open RS volume. Open the options. Make sure all these checkboxes are checked. Now when we render, you'll see the cloud is invisible. So under channel, write density. No caps or anything like that, just density. This is actually pretty important. Writing density isn't just a name, it's telling Max how you want the asset to look. So render it out and then you'll see that the VDB file is pure black. Now click on the Redshift dome light, go down to volume and on the contribution scale, go from zero to one and the samples to 512. Now when we render, you can see some real texture or density to this thing, um, which is cool. Um, now under the material editor for the absorption coefficient, change it to 0.1 and render it out. You can see now that this is where the tweaking of little details starts. From here out, there's a lot of just experimenting around that you can do to get the cloud to be the darkness or density and the color that you want. It's more just tweaking little buttons, but these are pretty much the buttons that we'll be using is the scatter absorption and advanced tab for old max new max old min and new min tweaking all these dials just changes the cloud till you get something that you like these are the numbers i started getting for me it was a lot of just experimenting until i got something that i wanted myself so change the scatter coefficient to 0.1 lowering this number makes it darker change the scatter coefficient back to one lower the absorption coefficient to 0.01 now the cloud is very bright. Absorption coefficient to 0.001, now it's completely overexposed in white. Switch the absorption coefficient to 0.065, scatter coefficient to 0.75, and it's much darker, more of a blue density. Now go through the light panel and select redshift sun. Place it by the dome and parent it to the dome. Move the sun so it's at an angle to the cloud that you like change the absorption to 0 0.007. Now you can start getting that fluffy, more realistic look to the clouds. It's all about small adjustments, really. Go and tint the scatter, red 0.8, green 0.9, and then enter that. From here, I imported the cloud assets I bought from TurboSquid. I started experimenting with those, but I ended up not using them because I couldn't get super close up with those assets, and they, aren't a hundred percent solid they have transparency that i didn't want for this scene um, and so i just didn't end up using them at all 
Next, I know I'm skipping a bit ahead here, but all that I did was just duplicate the cloud file. I scaled it differently, rotated it around, and through a lot of just trial and error, I made this scene with a bunch of clouds. One of the big ways that I did this was I turned on the progressive renderer with Redshift and I was able to see in real time live renders of what the scene would look like as I formed it. So if you just, you know, duplicate it and then just like rotate it around, change the size and the scale, change the lighting to where you want it. Eventually after like an hour of just like messing with it, I think you can get like a scene that you'll really like. From here, I made a camera and animated it moving forward over 150 frames. So for animating, this is a bit of a tangent on how to animate with keyframes, but say you turn on auto key, make a keyframe, go from frame zero and move it to frame 60 and make another keyframe. 3ds Max adds auto Bezier keys to the animation every single time. So when I made the camera animation, I didn't want it to gradually speed up and then slow down. So to stop this, open the curve editor. So select both of the keys and then click the set tangents to linear button. So after you do that, now you'll have hard starts and stops. And this is what I wanted to do with the camera animation. So I animated the camera pushing forward through the scene, made a really low quality test render. So that way it would just be like a super low quality thing that I could just render in like the span of two to four hours and see that, you know, the everything looks correct. You know, you don't have any mistakes or anything like that. Once I had everything that I wanted done with the test render and I liked it, how it looked, I made a 19 by 20 with like really low minimum samples. And then I just rendered that out. So now you have your render, you put it into After Effects. The next thing that we wanna do is we want to get the camera data from 3ds Max and we want to put that into After Effects so that we have the camera data. So to do that, click on the animated camera that you're using, right click and click hide unselected. Now we're only dealing with the objects we want to see and we're not distracted by the other things. And this will actually speed up your computer too. So for example's sake, just go into the camera panel um, and make a physical camera. Um, at the top, go to animation, constraints, position constraint. Select the point dot, attach the target point dot to your original point dot camera. Now select the position constraint again, select the physical camera and attach it to your original camera. So now unhide all, go to the helpers panel and under standard, select the dummy. Um, these are just point trackers. They're kind of like null objects um, if, if you're familiar with After Effects. So they're just like, they don't do anything, but they are just objects that exist in the 3D space that you can use to, when you import the camera data into After Effects, you can see where the objects are in the 3D space. Um, and that's my understanding of it at least. At the top in rendering, select state sets. Under compositor, select compositor link. Uncheck the boxes on lights and footage. Select state sets one on the side tab. Now select all the dummies and the camera that you created and attach to your original camera. With all the elements selected, click the create button. Save it to your computer. I'm naming mine compositor link 01. Now open up After Effects and under file, go to open compositor link Autodesk. Now, if you don't see it there, I didn't originally see it there either. And I had to go into the After Effects menus on Adobe, I think, and I, I had to download something. It was actually pretty easy, but um, it does confuse you. So I will link a separate video below on how you can do that. Select the create link button. This will open up a new composition with your camera data and dummies. Make sure the frame rate is correct here on the composition of your camera. Uh, click Control K and make it the same as your original cloud footage. And then from there, I just press Control C and then Control V and just drop it in, copy and paste it in. Then I made a white solid, turned it into 3D. And now you can see that it'll move in the 3D space correctly, just as the camera. From here, I drop my plane file over into the 3D file. The plane has to interact with the 3D camera. Now we also need the cloud layer to interact with the plane camera and its animation. Now, how do you get the airplane footage? That was one of the big questions that we were asking ourselves when we made this. One of the people who helped on this project, Josiah Bile, he helped to come up with the idea of rigging C-stands via fishing string to the airplane model. And so we strung the front, the back, the tail, and the wings with fishing string. And then uh, we put a light right by the plane, and that was an Aperture LS1S light panel, and we just backlit it. And then there's really two important things 
to nailing the airplane shot. You have to get the movement correct and then you have to get the lighting correct so that it interacts with the scene that you're comping it into. So for the movement, to give the look that the plane was flying through the scene, I substituted the plane's movement for my camera doing the inverse movement, walking my camera backwards instead. As the camera pulled back, one person moved the wings of the plane via the fishing string. I found that originally I was using the 24 to 105 lens, but after the last half of, of the plane model stuff was finished, I started finding that um, a 10 to 18 millimeter lens worked really well because any little movement is huge because the lens is so wide. So for the lighting, it's important that the light grazes the wing of the plane so that the light interacts with the plane. This is really, really important. Also, since the plane flies from in the shadow of the clouds out into the open, we had to have a flag blocking the light. All three of these elements had to be all in sync or else it wouldn't work at all. This process of getting the right movement and the correct lighting took quite a few tries to the point where I didn't think it'd actually work at all. But then like all VFX, you're working on the shot, then you take a break for 20 minutes, come back, and it actually starts to come together. When you import the airplane shot into After Effects, you want to start with the lighting of the plane to match the background first via the color. That way you don't waste your time rotoscoping the plane or trying to get the perfect movement that'll integrate well into the scene. I would get a still frame of the different variations and I would try to color match the plane to the environment. And then some wouldn't match at all. They wouldn't look realistic at all. And you could tell. If it doesn't look right, you're back to the drawing board. I used levels and curves to tweak the color. I went into the RGB channels, isolated the colors, starting with red, match it up, then green, then match it, then blue, and match it. Then I'd go back into the original shot. Does it look right? And then if it doesn't, which it usually wouldn't, then I'd make a, a new levels tool, um, and I'd just tweak the color just a hair here and there. The things I'm really looking for is the light too harsh or too soft. And then I'm also looking for the tint. In the plane shot, everything is tinted just a little bit blue. And so I had to make that same tint with the airplane. So being able to do the color match correctly, one of the things was I would look at the bright whites and you go at the top and then you look and see the number value of the bright whites on the airplane and the bright whites on part of the shot of the clouds. And then you try to match the number until it just looks correct. And then you do that with the dark values as well. And then that would get you in a better place. But overall, it really just comes to being able to discern what looks realistic and what doesn't and just not giving up until you get there pretty much. And this can come with having to redo the shot a lot of times. After all of that integrated well, I added a solid layer with a low 10 to 15% opacity that wisps past the camera Camera as the plane flies by, simulating the plane kicking up clouds into the camera, helping to interact with the shot just a little bit more. It's that last 5% that you have to try and add everything that I think helps make it work. And after all that was said and done, the shot was finished. So this is how the first shot of the Aviation Museum was done. I hope this helped. Let me know if you have any questions. I tried to be as thorough as I could with the details. I know at times I think I brush over a couple things, but if you're doing anything like this and you have any questions, just message me and I will definitely try and get back to you. All right. Thanks for watching.